And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. The crucifixion was the culmination of Jesus' ministry and the fulfillment of the prophecy. Given the importance of this event in the eyes of Christians, the cross became the most distinguished of all relics. But what did it look like? How big was it? Did Jesus have to carry his entire cross or just a portion of it? What exactly was the cause of death for condemned prisoners? Was Jesus' crucifixion any different from that of the other condemned prisoners? Could he have survived his torture? Where should I go to see a crucifixion taking place? Every year in the Philippines, a handful of Christians go through the motions of a pretend crucifixion to celebrate Easter. The bodies of these zealous Philippine Christians who voluntarily subject themselves to torture are not really suspended on the cross. Their feet rest on a wooden support and the nails are driven between their fingers and toes. Even so, the pain of these crucifixions is so intense that many Christians can't bear to look at the crosses, and a murmur of compassion moves through the crowd of onlookers. Things were quite different for Jesus' crucifixion. He was subject to an indescribably horrible torture. As far as Jesus' crucifixion is concerned, we could certainly say that Jesus wasn't treated particularly well. First of all, we need to put things into perspective. There were riots happening in Jerusalem back then. Zealots were going around killing Romans. It was the pilgrimage period, so there were a lot of pilgrims in the area. Estimates are that there were between 10,000 and 30,000 pilgrims camping around Jerusalem. So the situation was very tense, and Herod had intentionally come back to Jerusalem, staying in the Antonia Tower near the Jerusalem Temple, to keep an eye on the crowd. So when Jesus was arrested, and the temple priest wanted to put him to death, to restore public order, Pilate agreed to condemn him somewhat against his will. The soldiers perceived Jesus as one of Rome's enemies, stirring up trouble in the population. So they had no qualm about taking revenge on him. We need to bear in mind that when Jesus was alive, crucifixion was a very common method of execution in Palestine, and the occupying Roman army had become quite adept at carrying it out. It was used primarily for slaves, pirates, and thieves. It was a humiliating and shameful means of torture. According to ancient texts, it was customary in the Middle East for crucified men to beg passers-by to stone them to death, to put them out of their misery. Otherwise, they would die of thirst after spending eight days under the scorching sun. They were attached to a stake and they could last for several days, depending on the weather. Although it has been associated with the Romans, primarily due to Jesus' crucifixion, Romans were not the ones who invented crucifixion. We begin to understand that crucifixion was a typically Jewish method of execution. The Jews were hanging people on the cross long before Jesus came along. I think it was Alexander Janaeus or John Hyrcanus, one of the Maccabees, one of the Jewish princes who was fighting for his country's independence, 
I can't remember which of them it was, had 500 Jews crucified at once. Anyone who resisted his army was executed on the cross. And the Romans allowed it. That's what is interesting. They allowed the Judeans, the Jews at the time, to crucify Jesus according to their customs. In 1968, on the outskirts of Jerusalem, archaeologists discovered a tomb containing the remains of a man executed by crucifixion. There were still nails in the ankle and wrist bones. There was no special technique involved. The executioner simply did his job. In Jerusalem, no, it was Jericho, the skeleton of a crucified man was found during excavation work. There were nails stuck in the sides of his ankle bones. In a tomb in Jerusalem, dating back to Jesus' time, archaeologists found a very good illustration of this method. One of the ankle bones still had a nail in it. There were also major fractures in the leg bones, proving that the executioners had broken the victim's legs. This procedure was only used for Jewish crucifixions, to hasten a victim's death before sunset. Even before he was crucified, Jesus of Nazareth's case was different. His sentencing was not so simple after he was arrested. According to the Gospels, after Jesus was brought before Pilate one last time, he was taken away from the palace square. That was when the soldiers found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and compelled him to help Jesus bear his cross. Jesus was still able to walk after being tortured, and he was forced to carry his cross. He arrived at Golgotha absolutely exhausted, and he was so tired that he kept falling down. And that was when Simon of Cyrene took over whatever Jesus was carrying, the cross or a part of it. But what did this cross look like? The word itself, derived from the Latin word crux, also designates a pole, a stake, or stipes. The Gospels don't give any specific details about its shape and size. However, based on archaeological research conducted in Judea, we can now imagine the sequence of events with some degree of historical certainty. When he left the prison area where he had been tortured, the convict only carried a patibulum, a crossbeam that soldiers tied to the convict's shoulders using rope. This beam weighed between 10 and 20 kilograms. So it was a very striking method of execution, designed to serve as a lesson to all. The idea was to affix the body of the condemned person to a large cross placed in public view that passers-by could easily see, where the person was left to die of asphyxia, or a slow death. The cross consisted of a large stake, which remained at the crucifixion site, while the convict had to carry a crossbeam, referred to as the patibulum. This is the origin of the French expression mine patibulaire, which means hang dog look. We will never know for sure whether Jesus walked to Golgotha with an entire cross or just the patibulum. There have been many discussions on the subjects based on marks on his shoulders. On the Shroud of Turin, there's a particularly strong marking on the right shoulder, which leads some researchers to claim that Jesus carried the entire cross on his right shoulder, whereas a crossbeam would have been tied across his shoulder, creating more even pressure, not as heavy. But we need to look at the practical question, whether the executioner planted the vertical stake into the ground beforehand. They would have had to dig a deep hole and plant the stake firmly into the ground. It would have been simpler to prepare the stipes in advance and add the crossbeam afterwards. Prisoners were moved from their cell to the execution site, which was often outside of the city for sanitary reasons, because the convicts were left to die and their bodies sometimes decomposed on the cross. As they were taken to the execution site, there was an opportunity for the prisoners to escape, for friends to come and try to rescue them. So the Romans often tied the horizontal part of the cross to the prisoners, mainly because it was easier to prepare the vertical part in advance. Once the beam was tied to the prisoner, it was much harder to escape. Then the beam was looped in with those of the other prisoners. So even if anyone attempted to rescue a convict, they would be impeded by the patibulum, the shackles, and the soldiers. With an entire cross, the prisoner couldn't be shackled, and it was easier to escape. In Jesus' case, he was so weak after being beaten that he could hardly walk. 
If he had been forced to carry an entire cross, I don't think he would have made it more than 10 meters. It simply would have been too heavy. According to the relic being preserved at the Basilica of the Holy Cross, the patibulum was approximately one meter long. They used a light wood, so a meter long wooden beam would have weighed about 10, 15 kilograms. So the prisoner arrived at the execution site already bound. The beam was hoisted up to the top of the cross, which wasn't very high, around two meters. There was no need for scaffolding. Next, the feet were bound to the cross. In Jesus' case, they were nailed to the cross. But for other convicts, a small wooden block was used as a footrest below or between the legs. Given how exhausted Jesus was, carrying the patibulum must have felt like bearing the weight of a mountain. After he had fallen a few times, the Romans understood that at the rate they were going, Jesus would never make it to Golgotha alive. Suppositions are that the beam was taken down from his shoulders. And since none of the soldiers would carry it, they instructed Simon of Cyrene to do it. Once they arrived in Golgotha, which was outside of the city limits, Jesus was stripped and sprawled out on the ground. His arms were attached to the patibulum. When the convict arrived at the execution site with the patibulum on his shoulders, the crossbeam was hoisted up onto the stake, and the convict was affixed to the cross, sometimes using ropes, sometimes using long nails driven into the hands and feet. The nails were about 18 centimeters long, and then the person was just left to die. When the nails were driven in this way, they did not fracture any bones and ensured a solid grip on the wood. The convict would instantly feel excruciating pain spreading throughout his arms up to his neck. This cruel torture in itself was enough to make most men pass out. And if the convict was not dead by the end of the day, his legs would be broken to hasten his death. Above the cross was a wooden sign, also referred to as a titleus, a sort of small panel, on which was inscribed the name of the person and the reason for his execution. Once Jesus was nailed to the patibulum, the beam was hoisted up and joined together with the tip of the stipes. The final result was more a T-shape than a four-sided cross. The dangling feet were flattened against the stipes, one on top of the other, then a nail was driven between the second and third metatarsus in the center of the foot. So all movement was impossible. As the convict became more and more exhausted, their body went through a series of biological challenges. They had cramps, which could not be relieved by adjusting the body. The body temperature rose to 40 degrees Celsius, so the person would break into an incredible sweat. Blood would stop circulating. All of the emergency systems in the body would go into full gear to help the body survive. So blood was not circulating throughout the body, and it would begin to turn a purple maroon color. Add dust and traces of blood to the mix, and you can see just how absolutely disgusting it was. It was horrible to watch. And then the rib cage would gradually become paralyzed. Since the chest was no longer receiving any oxygen, a heart attack was inevitable. Their lungs would fill with fluid and they would have a heart attack. My guess is that he probably died of asphyxiation, possibly both. When he was taken to Golgotha, Jesus was already in excruciating pain. The crucifixion was the final step in a long journey of violence, flagellation, the crown of thorns, physical torture, crucifixion, and finally, the piercing of the lance in Jesus' side. Although he was in unbearable pain, after three long hours of agony, Jesus probably died of cardiorespiratory problems. Once he died, Jesus' body was taken off the cross and placed in the tomb. As for the cross, its history was just beginning. The cross was about to become a powerful symbol. After Jesus' ascension, Christianity quickly began to spread. This budding Christianity was perceived as a threat. The first persecutions were primarily orchestrated by traditional Jews who saw Christian teachings and tolerance as a violation of the laws of Abraham. 
Persecuted by their fellow Jews, the first Christians faced retaliation by the occupying Romans. In the early fourth century, Diocletian issued a series of edicts demanding that Christians sacrifice to the Roman gods. Those who refused to comply were arrested, tortured, and executed. Under the shadow of the Roman palace, Christians believed that only a miracle could save them. Their angel of salvation was named Constantine. Emperor Constantine played an absolutely crucial role in the history of Christianity. Because at the beginning of the fourth century, persecution of Christians was at its high point. And this persecution was widespread. All of a sudden, a few years later, after 312, all of the emperor's policies changed. According to legend, Constantine found himself fighting against Maxentius, for control of the Western Empire. In 312, a very important battle was waged against Maxentius, north of Rome, at the Milvian Bridge. His enemy was Maxentius, a cruel tyrant who was ruling Rome at the time. Maxentius prayed to evil forces. He had women and children beheaded and read their entrails in the belief that this would help him to predict the future. Constantine, on the other hand, was not Christian, but he worshipped gods and I guess you could say he had the right sentiments. And one night, Jesus Christ appeared before him and told him, carry the laparum before your troops and you will be victorious. This was the moment of the famous in hoc signo vinces. By this sign, you will conquer. The laparum was the military standard of banners supported by a staff and a horizontal bar creating the shape of a cross. And on the purple banner, embroidered in gold, was the famous monogram of Christ, XP, the first two letters of the Greek word for Christ. On October 28, 312, Constantine emerged as the victor. He converted to Christianity and became the very first Christian emperor in history. From then on, as of 312, he declared Christianity to be legal. In fact, Christianity became the official state religion toward the end of the fourth century. In 313, Constantine issued what is referred to as the Edict of Milan, which gave Christians the right to practice their religion and he gave back churches that had been confiscated. This was very important to the Catholic religion because this was when the Catholic religion was recognized. And Constantine obviously played a very significant role, building Christian churches in Rome and in the Holy Land. He was already viewed as someone who favored the veneration of relics, since he had ordered excavation of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Under his reign, fragments of the wood from Jesus' cross were also found. He had basilicas constructed, one of which was in Rome, on the site of the remains of St. Peter and St. Paul, and according to legend and tradition, on the site of other remains as well. While Constantine was overseeing the building of his empire, his mother, Helena, who had also converted to Christianity, decided to go on a pilgrimage to Palestine. Helena is another figure who is both historic and legendary. She was the mother of Constantine the Great, the famous Roman Christian emperor. And she was also a Christian herself. She lived to be quite old, she died in 327 or 329. Shortly before she died, she went to the Holy Land for various reasons. And apparently, she was on hand for an excavation of the Calvary site where they found the Holy Cross. According to legend, it was there in a cave near the site of the Calvary that she discovered three crosses the one on which Jesus had died, 
and the two on which the thieves had been crucified at the same time. The largest piece of the cross was left in Jerusalem, while some of the smaller fragments were taken to Rome, then Constantinople. What became of those fragments? It seems that a large piece of the cross that St. Helena had left at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem is now being preserved in Liebana in northern Spain at the monastery of Santo Toribio. The monastery is located near Potes in the mountains of northern Spain. When I visited Santo Toribio, I was given permission to film the holy object in the Lignum Crucis Chapel. According to a scientific investigation conducted in 1958 by researchers at Madrid's Forestry Research Institute in Spain, the relic is made from a very old Mediterranean cypress wood that grew in Judea when Jesus was alive. That's where all certainty ends. Allegedly, a large fragment was placed at the entrance to the Constantinople Imperial Palace as a good luck talisman. It is not known what happened to the fragment. What if it is still there? I'm back in Istanbul, the city of divine wisdom. It lies on both sides of the Bosphorus Strait, straddling Europe and Asia. When you arrive by boat, it is easy to imagine the great battles that took place in these waters, which are now much calmer. Istanbul remains Turkey's main port and business center. This was one of the largest cities of ancient times, along with Rome and Athens. It is also one of the only cities in the world to have had three different names, Istanbul, Byzantium, and Constantinople. This last name comes from the first Roman Christian emperor, Constantine. The Romans came second century AD during the Septimus Severus and the new uh, city, city walls, town, uh, city uh, walls have been built. And then comes Constantine the Great. So he fell in love with the town and he said, so let us call it Nea Roma, New Rome. And you know the story. So it, was, it became the capital of the Romans. And then after the separation, it became the capital of the Eastern Romans. And Eastern Romans later on was called Byzantines, in a way, or the historians call it Byzantine. The city of Istanbul is home to a monument that epitomizes medieval architecture, the Church of Saint Sophia. Okay. So Saint Sophie. Saint Sophie. No, this is not Saint Sophie. This is Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia means divine wisdom, holy wisdom. So it's not related to any lady or gentleman saint. Okay. No, forget about it. This is Hagia Sophia, and this is from the sixth century. Okay. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Hagia Sophia, Church of the Holy Wisdom of God, has very ancient architectural elements incorporated into it. This pre-Christian gate used to be in an old, big, huge building. So they carried this from that building. So that's why we got these swastika signs, which used to be a symbol of the river Meander. So the swastika is not just a symbol used by the Nazi during the Second no, World no, War. No. I mean, the oldest swastika signs were from this land, something like 2000, BC, okay, and it was also in India, those kind of signs like a Buddhist symbol or Hindu symbol, something like 1000 BC, and here in this country, that uh, tradition continued. You know, this is not related to any Nazi sign here. Okay, so, so this is the bronze gate. Okay. okay. Initially constructed by Emperor Constantine, Hagia Sophia was burnt to the ground during a riot in 404. A second church was built, only to be burned down once again a century later. Emperor Justinian decided to build a basilica larger than Solomon's temple itself. 
Thanks to 10,000 general laborers and 100 master masons, this feat was accomplished in less than six years. Hagia Sophia was so beautiful that when the city fell to the Ottomans, Sultan Mehmed II prevented it from being destroyed. Since the Christian mosaics were blasphemous in the eyes of the Muslims, the Sultan had them plastered over. For a thousand years, the dome in the center of the Hagia Sophia was the largest in the world. Muslims were so fascinated with this design that they integrated it into the magnificent Blue Mosque, which was constructed across from the Basilica. During an excavation of the historic Sultanahmet Square in the 1930s, workers discovered a series of extraordinary mosaics. Apparently, they were used to decorate the pavement of an inner court at the Imperial Palace. Nowadays, the collection of mosaics, a puzzle with some 80 million pieces to it, is being housed at the Great Palace Mosaic Museum. A few blocks from the Mosaic Museum lies an extraordinary cistern hidden under the ground. It is believed that it was built by Emperor Constantine to serve the Imperial Palace. Its archway is supported by 336 marble pillars, each nine meters high, give it the look of a cathedral. Oddly enough, two of these columns have a Medusa's head at their base. These heads were taken from the ruins of an ancient pagan temple to serve as blocks for two pillars that were too short to reach the archway. In days gone by, to the west of the Blue Mosque was the Hippodrome. It was the heart of ancient Constantinople. It was here that brave men competed in two or four horse chariot races. All that is left of this massive structure is part of the stable walls that dominate the market square. The magnificent bronze horses that adorned the facade were stolen during the Crusades and taken to Venice, where they now decorate the main entrance to San Marco Basilica. And in the middle of Sultanahmet Square was Constantine's imperial palace, where according to tradition, the emperor's mother brought back a fragment of the true cross. But where exactly was it kept? With all of the battles over the years, the palace was totally destroyed. As strange as it may seem, my quest has taken me to a carpet vendor on Kutlugun Street, a five minute walk from Hagia Sophia. My destination is the Bashdogan Asia Minor carpet shop. A few years ago, the owner, Mehmet Bashdogan, decided to expand the inside of his shop. As soon as the picks hit the ground, the workers broke open a hole leading to an underground chamber. Bashdogan told the workers to stop what they were doing and contacted the city authorities. This underground chamber turned out to be one of the lower rooms of Constantine's imperial palace. Since this discovery was made, the merchant has no longer been free to do business behind his shop, as the area has been officially declared a historic monument, a wonder that is off limits to the public. Mr. Bashdogan invited me to visit his palace. How can I possibly describe this magical place? As I walked down into the chamber, I felt like Howard Carter entering King Tut's tomb. I walked alone in the first chamber. It was huge. It was in this very spot 16 centuries ago that Emperor Constantine the Great walked, spoke, and lived. What a dizzying thought. There are no frescoes here, no mosaics, no objects of any value. The austerity of the setting makes you wonder if these rooms were not part of the imperial living quarters after all. If Helena did bring back a fragment of the true cross, it certainly wasn't to be found in this part of the palace. Outside is a well that has long since been abandoned and dried out. According to legend, this well is connected to an underground tunnel that leads to other rooms in the palace. What if the fragment of the cross were at the other end of this hypothetical tunnel? I wasn't going to let this golden opportunity pass me by. Without thinking twice, I was lowered down to the three passageways. My hopes were dashed when I saw that the passageway was blocked by centuries of dirt and dust.
As I left Constantine's palace, there was only one thing on my mind, and that was to head to Rome. The Basilica of the Holy Cross of Jerusalem in Rome is one of the seven pilgrim churches of Rome. It is said that the church was built on the site of St. Helena's ancient palace. The Basilica di Santa Croce, the Holy Cross, was built in 325 under Constantine's reign as a tribute to his mother Helena. This basilica was built at the same time as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. It was in this church that they preserved the Titulus Crucis and the fragment of the cross brought back by the emperor's mother. Father Simone Fiorasso, the parish priest for the Basilica of the Holy Cross, told me the story of her trip. So St. Helena, close to 80 years old, decided to go to Jerusalem because after her conversion, she felt a calling to look for relics associated with the cross. She said, it's not fair that I have an imperial palace and my Lord didn't even have a place to rest his bones. After a long trip, Helena arrived in Jerusalem with the imperial boats. With the help of the Judeans, Helena naturally found what she was looking for. From what we know, she found several different crosses. And with one of these crosses, a dying person was miraculously healed. This cross became known as the True Cross. It was broken down into three parts and given to Helena. One for Jerusalem, one for Constantinople, where her son ruled, and one for Santa Croce in Rome, where she wanted to build the new Jerusalem. According to legend, during these excavations in Jerusalem, Helena also found the Titulus Crucis that Pilate had placed on Jesus' cross, stating the reason for his death. Hello. Every convict was identified, meaning that a small wooden panel was placed at the top of the cross, about 20 by 60 centimeters, large enough that it could be read from a good distance. And this panel on the cross stated that the convict was being put to death, for instance, because he was a thief or because he was a murderer. And Jesus' elogium stated why he was being put to death. What it usually retained is the letters I-N-R-I, which stands for Jesu Nazarenus Rex Jodiachum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. But that was an assumption made during the Renaissance period, long after his death. There are claims that Helena broke this relic into three pieces. The eulogium was preserved. It was found by Saint Helena, Constantine's mother, who went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and found holy relics like the cross and other relics associated with the Passion of Christ. So Saint Helena cut this Titulus Crucis, this elogium, into three pieces and gave the largest fragment to Rome. And a basilica was built in its honor, the Basilica of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem. Naturally, when Helena brought the relics back to Santa Croce, she immediately built a place for public worship of the relics, including a chapel for the relics, baptismal fonts, and catechumens. With the arrival of the relics, the church became more open to the public. Helena had to reserve a part of her palace to receive the throngs of followers who came to Rome on the path to conversion. The Basilica of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem was constructed over a period of time. To honor the presence of these extraordinary relics, religious leaders had the Basilica decorated with beautiful mosaics. A century later, faced with the threat of an attack by the Goths and the Huns, authorities decided to hide the elogium. They hid it in a special place near the archway, just below the ceiling. This is the stone that was used to lock the relics in the church's highest vault during the time of the barbarian invasions. When there were invasions, the monks protected the relics by hiding them in a vault, in a wall at the entrance to the church. There was an angel on the wall in the center of the vault. The relic faded into the woodwork, a memory of the past, until painters discovered it in 1492. We have the story of Leonardo de Sarazana. It was an existing document 
that was held at the Vatican. This monk explained how renovations were done to the roof and attic, which were approximately 18 meters high, if we start measuring here. They had water infiltration. They needed to repair the attic and repaint it. The workers told Sarzana that at one point, as they were tapping on the wall to find the spots where the plaster had been damaged, they sensed an empty space behind the wall. They wanted to know what was in this empty space. And what they found was a small opening. Behind this opening was a stone turned upside down. On the inside of it was written Titulus Crucis. The stone has been kept. And behind this stone, there was a lead box. The only thing in the box was a wooden panel with the above inscription. It was a huge surprise. Leonardo de Sarzana said that three language experts were called in. They immediately saw that the text was written in three different languages, Greek and Latin, which were not too difficult to read, and then there was Hebrew, which was more complicated. The experts immediately recognized the Titulus Crucis. The discovery was perceived as a true miracle. It was even officially recognized by Pope Innocent VIII. The eulogium is now preserved in a glass-covered silver reliquary, allowing visitors to read what remains of the inscription. The reliquary is housed in the Chapel of the Holy Relics behind an air-conditioned glass panel. The titulus, or elogium, has three different types of writing on it, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. It was written from right to left, making it easy for Hebrews to read quickly, which means that it couldn't have been written by anyone other than a Hebrew. On the panel, the first line of writing is in Hebrew, the second line is written in Greek, and the third line is written in Latin. In my opinion, from a Hebrew perspective, the most important line for text to be written on would have been the first line. From a Roman perspective, the last line would have been the most important, since it was closest to the crucified person's head. The Greek inscription on the eulogium is not the same as the description given in the Gospel of John, but the two sentences mean the same thing. Another interesting point is about the Greek a line does not give the correct Nazarios, not, not which we have in John 1919 19 and in the, in the Christian uh, tradition as the Greek line, but uh, just uh, a Greek transcription of the Latin Nazarenos. Whoever wrote it did not think of the correct Greek way uh, to put it into Greek grammar um, and to write Nazarios but he just transcribed it in Greek letters uh, in the Latin way. So it must um, have been written by someone who was not accustomed to uh, a Christian tradition. He didn't even write Nazarenos, but Nazarenos, which is uh, a, a perfect Latin uh, um, translation of the Hanosri, um, when the Christian tradition always spoke of the Nazarene. Whoever wrote the eulogium confused the Hebrew word Nazarenus, which means from Nazareth, with the word Nazarenus, which means dedicated to God. If we follow this line of reasoning, the inscription should not have read Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, but rather Jesus dedicated to God, King of the Jews. But if the eulogium was a fake, wouldn't the crafters have chosen the same wording as that used in canonical texts? The biggest issue was the text written from right to left. But in
reality, the Hebrew text was written in the proper direction. So, whoever had it inscribed, I believe that was Pilate, had it done by a Judean. And for a Judean, back then, it would have been no problem to inscribe text from right to left. So, it's incorrect to say that the text was written backwards, because it was quite normal in those days for a Hebrew to write that way. There were issues with the writing. They thought that it was backwards. But now, archaeologists recognize that it was typical of ancient writing from 20 centuries ago. Why did Pilate feel the need to write the word Nazarenus on Jesus' elogium? It was of no consequence. The sentence was not against the residents of Nazareth, but rather against a man claiming to be the Son of God. And John 19:19 19, 19 gives the inscription uh, in the most complete way as Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, which fulfills the criteria of a Roman title because titles were used for executions in the Roman uh, period, and it has to give the name of the executed person and the reason why he was put to death. And uh, here it was the claim to be the king of the Jews. And in a political way, it reached the death penalty to make a crime out of his claim, a crime against the imperial laws of Rome. Now we can see why the high priest were so anxious to go to Pilate and ask him to change the wording on the elogium, which the Judean ruler refused to do, saying, what I have written, I have written. In 2002, scientists at Romatre University, in collaboration with the University of Arizona in the United States, obtained permission to remove a fragment from the back of the elogium for analysis purposes. The sample was carefully cleaned and prepared for carbon testing. I was the one who ordered the carbon testing. The study began in 1993 and progressed bit by bit. There were some trust issues on the part of the monks. We finally got them to agree to all of the tests on the wood, including taking photos and doing carbon dating. The wood was not very well suited for carbon dating tests. I would say that the carbon-14 results place it somewhere between 1000 and 1680. Basically, according to carbon testing, the Titulus Crucis is far too young to have been the inscription placed over Jesus' head when he was crucified. As soon as the results of this analysis were released, critics questioned the carbon-14 tests without providing a convincing argument. The inscription looks like it could be the original. It's as if someone made a copy of the original. Personally, I'm convinced that it's the wood panel ordered by Pilate, but I can't prove that with carbon-14 tests. I can, however, prove it with the inscription because of the simplicity of the writing. If it had been forged in the 15th or 16th century, it would have looked like that. It would have had perfect calligraphy. Archaeology wasn't very advanced back then, and if the Titillus Crucis dates back to, let me see, the last time it was recognized was in 1180, somewhere around then. So it would go back as early as the 10th century if it was a hoax, for example. Some people believe that the discovery of an authentic relic of Christ would end the debate once and for all. Whatever the case may be, the symbol of the cross is now universally associated with Christianity. It is understandable that some Christians might be driven to want to find a fragment of the cross. But is it really that important? In the end, isn't a piece of wood simply a piece of wood? For Christians throughout the world, Christ's existence does not need to be proven by a linen cloth or a fragment of wood. The mystery of faith will never be solved by science.